So you wanna be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up guys and welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani. Today I'm joined by MC Laubscher. MC is an investor, entrepreneur, and cash flow expert. He helps business owners and investors create, protect, and multiply, multiply their wealth in times of great change. MC, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, really excited to talk today. We were talking offline, um, a lot to cover. Real quick though, you know, like I mentioned, just kind of give us the Reader's Digest version, how you even discovered this whole uh, this whole industry. Yeah, so I uh, grew up in, a, in South Africa. So my, my accent is not Pennsylvanian where I reside currently, <laughs> but I uh, grew up in South Africa during a very, very interesting time in the country's history. Um, and I mean, that basically developed who I am today, critical thinker, questioning everything, looking for alternative information and alternative um, resources. Um, I uh, traveled after university uh, when I left South Africa. So this is, I would say, early two, 2000s, ended up in the United States in 2001, thought it was one of the great, greatest places, still think that. Um, it has enormous upside potential for anyone that wants to come and do something here. If M Americans don't realize that if they're born in, in the United States, they literally want a lottery ticket. Um, and most immigrants that, that end up here see it that way. There's just no place with upward mobility and opportunities um, like the U.S. presents. And I still feel the same way that uh, even in all of, amidst all of the chaos over the past couple of years. Um, but I um, played sports. And I did so up until 2007. So I actually played in a national league um, here, sports and traveled quite a bit. So we would fly and people get into bad habits, playing video games and all that kinds of stuff with all the guys traveling. I read books. So my background was in economics and history and I have an MBA in finance, but I, I just started reading books and came across Robert K. Saki's book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, took action, bought my first property in 2001 collected the rent uh, from, uh, from my tenants that I put in there, uh, paid all of the expenses. And guess what? There was money left over at the end of the month. And I was like, this is cash flow, like in the book. How many times can I do this? Um, I didn't have to physically work for this. Um, this is contractual. How many times can I do this? That was the light bulb that went off for me. Um, and since then, uh, you know, through my studies and, and, and just studying uh, basically uh, the monetary system, the world global financial system and the banking system, I figured out cash flow is great, but how do I cash flow better? I create my own banking system, just like the banks. Um, and then the third big light bulb moment for me was figuring out that I don't need to be the person that knows everything and that does everything. I think most people get stuck in that trap. And that was a big, massive switch that I made that I started to realize, man, I don't need to be the person knowing everything that needs to be known about pick your favorite asset class, multifamily. I can find a cash flow ninja, tap into their intellectual shortcuts, their network shortcuts, and leverage uh, their skill sets, their capabilities, and their relationships, and go much faster, much quicker. So how do I partner with them? How do I invest with them rather than being the weekend warrior that thinks that they can compete with a cash flow ninja that's operating, you know, nonstop in that space seven days a week? Um, so those are my three big my three big moments on my journey, which led me to you know doing many different things in the alternative asset space. Um, most folks. Um, if, if they've heard uh, of things that I'm involved with, they've probably heard of the Cashflow Ninja, which I started in 2016, a podcast, um, which has now been downloaded in over 180 countries, millions of downloads, which wow. has turned into an educational company. Um, and then also, um, I started two other companies, Producers Wealth, uh, where uh, I have a team that helps folks all over the United States. We're in 49 states. 
implement and execute cash flow management strategies. Um, and then also we, we, we do a lot of fun projects in the multifamily resort and other alternative asset space. Um, I've got a, a company called Producers Capital Partners where we help investors uh, invest in, uh, you know, and invest alongside them in, in this, in the alternative space. So it's been a lot of fun. It's a, it's a, it's a fun, fun little niche, this alternative asset world. Yeah, you touched on a lot of really, really great points. And I really want to, you know, I know we'll kind of get to all of them. But one big one that you mentioned there towards the end was being able to leverage, you know, people who do this full time, right. And, and that's a big thing that I talk about is, and that was really the transformation for me was, instead of, you know, listen, you can read as many books as you want, listen to every podcast there is, but until you either put something into action, or, you know, go partner with someone who's doing that, you're really not going to progress. And that was like my light bulb moment too, was I joined a mentorship group and holy cow, what a, what a huge difference that makes. And, and, you know, I focus on the capital raising side and that lets me leverage all these, you know, incredible operators and all the different asset classes. So love that a ton. So let's kind of get into it now. I know you guys have, you know, really awesome framework. So kind of talk about, you know, the, the progression of this framework and what it looks like in terms of, you know, setting up that cash flow and, and, and that whole uh, process. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you, um, and, and I mean, this is, this happens in the marketing world, right? When you look at how we're marketed to about money, about wealth, about investments, it's everything is sort of in its own little silo, essentially. Um, and it's, you know, everybody focuses on one particular thing at a time. Um, but in reality, if you look at how the folks that are operating, uh, the 0.01% are operating, they have a full on strategy. They have a strategy, which does many different things for them with many, many different components. And they have many different vehicles and tools uh, and tactics within that strategy. So I think sometimes because we've been marketed to our entire life that way and indoctrinated, we feel, okay, I just need to be, let's, for example, pick a real estate investor and I'm a real estate investor and that's all that I've done. And trust me, I was there when I first started. That was just me. I was a real estate investor and that's all that I did, but I didn't understand that there's an, there's all these different things that I didn't have in place as a real estate investor and when you do figure out when you don't have them in place and what you should have in place is when you get kicked in the teeth, right? Then you're like, man, I should have this proper tax strategy. I didn't have that. Oh, I should have had proper asset protection. You know, I didn't have liquidity or my capital wasn't positioned efficiently. That ties into, all right, you got to do what the pros do. The 0.01% have a strategy a wealth strategy. So the framework that we use to create a strategy is the first pillar of that framework is uh, cash creation. And that is essentially people making money. And there's different ways to make money. You can make money in the capacity as an employee, a professional, like a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist and so forth, or as an entrepreneur and a business owner, or even as an investor. So there's ways that you could obviously generate income more efficiently when you do it in the capacity of an entrepreneur or a business owner. There's a lot of tax benefits available to you right away when you're doing it as an investor. There's a lot of tax of benefits available. When you're doing it in the capacity of a W-2 or a 1099, not as efficient necessarily as an entrepreneur or a business owner, but there's the, now you have to be cognizant of that, right? And say, okay, I need to I'm not as efficient there, but I can bring in other things that can enhance my efficiency. You know, there's folks that that are, I mean, let's just pick a dentist that loves to be a dentist and that's what they want to do. They might not even necessarily want to run their practice or own their own practice. They just love doing uh, dental work and they make a really good living at it. So instead of now being an entrepreneur or a business owner to become more efficient, there's other things that they can do in their economy to become more efficient. So the second pillar actually is after you make money, you have to put it somewhere and protect it. And that is what we call cash capture. And that's capital positioning. One of the most important things out there is capital positioning. 
a lot of people know how to make money. A lot of people know how to invest properly, but what really brings the two together is proper capital positioning. So um, how do you position your capital after you've made it that you can number one, be a, an, a, as effectively and efficiently positioned from taxes, be well protected from an asset protection standpoint, um, allow the, that piece of capital to be leveraged, let's just say, or collateralized, one of my favorite strategies, which I'll share. Um, that's key because here's what the pros do. The pros position their capital either in, let's just say, cash, which they use life insurance vehicles for, which I'll share in a second, or they do it in gold and silver, or they do it, let's just say, in crypto or in stocks. Um, but once they've put it in there and captured that, they collateralize it. So what is collateralization? Well, most folks that are real estate investors, they know of a HELOC, right? Well, a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, is where you collateralize the equity of that home. And now you have a line of credit that you can use to go buy another home, a second home, or a short-term rental and so forth. You've collateralized the equity in the home that you have right now, and you've used that to acquire another home. Use one asset to acquire another asset without selling it. Business owners know it. They can essentially put the receivables and the, the assets of the business up as collateral for a business line of credit or a business loan. We have someone in our network which got a business loan and bought the property from which the, the business was operating. So this person took a business and asset, collateralized it, and then bought the building, real estate. Now they have two assets. They used one asset to buy another one. You could do the same thing with stocks. Uh, Elon Musk is famous for this. He was in some lawsuit or something, and he had to actually do some filings. And this was in 2019. And it showed that Elon had $500 million in loans in which he used these Tesla shares as collateral to get those loans. And this is asset-based lending. And those folks are getting at like 1%, you know, around there. Basically free money for Elon. Yep. Why would he do that? Well, if he had to sell those Tesla shares, he would pay taxes. The same way with real estate, the same way with a business, you sell that to buy real estate, there's taxable events. Same thing with gold, silver, and art. You could get a collateral. Sorry, and go I, ahead. And I'm sorry to interrupt real quick. I just want to point out that common people can do this as well with their stock, right? If you have, yep. you know, a huge, uh, big um, uh, position in Apple or you're an employee of a, of a publicly traded tech stock, you can collateralize your employee stock as well and do the same thing that we're talking about. So I just wanted to point that out as well because it's not just, you know, the CEOs of the companies that can do this. So yeah, absolutely. Sorry, yeah. And then gold, silver, and art. You can place it as collateral. There's custodians that will allow you to do that. There's even banks, you know, JP Morgan Chase, not to advertise them, but I think they do something similar. Um, but um, essentially, you can collateralize your gold, silver, and art and get up to 50% of the value. And now you have liquidity. Same thing. If you sell your gold, silver, your art, there's a taxable event. And you could get up to 50% of the value and use it. So if you think the world's coming to an end, let's, for example, and you're stocked up in gold, but you, you want to ca essentially buy cash flow assets, you can leverage your gold to buy real estate that produces income for you. The same thing with crypto. Um, boys and girls, be careful with that one. You could get your fingers burnt because it's very volatile, but you could get up to 50% of uh, in a loan using your crypto Bitcoin or Ethereum as collateral. Yeah, so you can essentially use your Bitcoin to buy real estate. Um, so a lot of folks have heard about that. We use also a life insurance strategy and most folks might, might've heard of bank of yourself or uh, infinite banking or, you know, there's many different terms for it, but essentially what it is is you take a dividend paying whole life insurance policy with a mutual insurance company and you structure it specifically for high cash value. So this is, this is not buying a life insurance policy uh, in the manner um, that the main benefit is a death benefit. Most people think life insurance and they think, oh, this isn't so cool because somebody has to die for someone else to benefit, right? No, we're actually looking at the, the living benefits. 
uh, banks, corporations, and family offices, especially $100 million and up net worth families. Um, they love this uh, because it's structured for cash value. So if you put in premiums into this policy, approximately 70 plus percent could be going straight towards cash, a savings vehicle. So why would you put money in a life insurance contract? Well, there's guarantees, guarantees of your principal. That's kind of a big thing. Guarantees of growth. You know, usually these policies are going to grow about 3% guaranteed. Dividends, which is not guaranteed, but one of these carriers, for example, to give you an, uh, an idea of mutual insurance companies, which is not listed on the stock exchanges, one of them have been around since the 1840s and have paid dividends every single year consecutively. Wow. We're talking like pre-Civil War, you know, period. period. Um, so that's how, that's how uh, powerful they've been. Um, and by the way, it's all tax-free. The growth is tax-free. Dividends is tax-free. You get to collateralize the cash value in that vehicle through a policy loan, which the loan is tax-free. Um, and then if it's structured properly, it could be set up as your own private, quote-unquote, pension. This is how corporations use it through COLI, Corporate Own Life Insurance, or BOLI, Bank Own Life Insurance. But essentially, corporations structure executive comp packages, key men, uh, uh, and, and, and or woman, key person packages. Um, but essentially on the back end, you get to draw a tax-free income stream if you wanted to. But in the meantime, you get to access it and then invest in real estate. Invest Are there in minimum requirements for these? Yeah. Like, yeah, like you what are the minimum requirements? Like, what does it look like? You know, do you have to have a certain net worth to set these up? Or what does that kind of look like? This is the beauty about this. You don't have to be a Rockefeller to do what the Rockefellers do. When it makes sense is you would need to put at least $10,000 a year into this to make it work because there's still an insurance portion, right? Um, there's an insurance portion and then you can overfund your insur the insurance uh, part to, to add more to it. But you still there's still an insurance portion. So I would say $10,000 um, a minimum is what you need to commit per year to make this work for you. Um, so why would you put it into something like this? You know, all the insiders don't keep money in banks. You know, if you look at the richest family, they own the banks, but they don't keep their cash there. It's in insurance contracts. You know, most folks might have heard of the Rockefeller method where this has been sort of um, been popularized as the Rockefellers built up a family bank, a, a family pool of capital, which they can, the family members can then access to buy assets such as businesses, such as real estate. Um, and it all comes from the family's pool of capital. Now, again, you don't have to be a Rockefeller to do what the Rockefellers do. You can start small and, and build your own pool of capital and build your own family's pool of capital and eventually finance the things that you want, whether it be um, the large purchases that you got uh, that you're making whether it be assets that you're acquiring whether it be debt that you're uh, paying off or whether it be you know even college planning and funding for your children so you can fund that all out of your family bank and essentially this is the core of your family bank is this life insurance strategy so that's capital positioning i mean there's different ways to do it I love the life insurance because number one, I can get up to 90% of my cash value. It's guaranteed. It's growing tax-free and it has a death benefit. Compare that to my gold and silver, which I've, I've utilized that strategy before. My crypto, which I've utilized that strategy before too. Um, I prefer that over all, all of those other ones. You know, Even stocks are great. And if you're a capital raiser, have these conversations with people. They don't even know that they have money available to invest or that they have money in these vehicles because no one no one's talked to, uh, to them about that. I'll give you an example. You're going to enjoy this. I did a presentation the one year at a pretty large real estate conference, national conference. Um, and after I did this, had this exact same conversation, this gentleman comes up to me, very older gentleman. And he said, are you telling me I could use the cash value in one of my whole life policies to buy real estate? And I said, yes, you can. And he said, you know, I have two of these policies that were set up for me ages ago. It's in our family. And I also set up one. You know, there's probably a million bucks in there combined. And I didn't know that you could do this. And I'm like, well, we just found you a million bucks. So wow. he, um, yeah. And he can use 90% of that, up to 90% of that. Up to 90%, yeah. And um, wow. 
Yeah. So he, he, his ticket was worthwhile paying for, for that conference. Right. Um, he found a million bucks. So pillar one, cash creation, pillar two, cash capture, capital positioning. Pillar three is just cash flow creation, generating cash flow. And now you're deploying that capital into different asset classes, finding the, 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 the top people um, in the different niches and partnering with them. Pillar um, four is just cash growth. There could be areas of, 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 of capital that you want to position in, in growth. Um, and that's just looking at bottlenecks in the economy where that's at, you know, um, like for example, energy, huge, anybody think there's a bottleneck in energy right now at the time of recording? Well, a lot of people will get depressed at the gas prices at the pump that they're paying, but how about positioning yourself in uh, energy uh, uh, sectors or different areas that you know that's going to explode? Here's an example. Um, the windmills that you see and the solar panels and that kind of stuff, it's not going to power the world. Just a, just a fun fact for folks out there. You're going to need other sources of energy. Anybody that has looked into this knows this. All the insiders knows that, know this. Doesn't seem that they do in Washington, but it's not going to be. So where's the energy going to come from when they shut down the oil and gas and all these pipelines? It's going to be nuclear. What is nuclear? Uranium. Uranium is like to produces 10% of the world's energy right now. Do you think that's going to increase in the coming months? Um, again, not financial advice, just giving you an example of how to think through a bottleneck. You know, usually there's bottlenecks in the economy and you could position capital in areas for growth. If you're looking at industry growth, like crypto and blockchain, you don't have to buy a doggy coin and hope it goes up. You can invest in crypto businesses that will go up in value regardless of what the markets do. You know, carbon credits is another big space, that whole green energy kind of space. Um, again, be a realist. Don't get sucked into all of the fluff. There's opportunity there. There's a bottleneck. And then the final pillar of this framework is, well, what's your biggest threat? What will be the biggest single check that you will ever write in your life? If, you, if you're not listening to this podcast and you're not going to take action, taxes. So you have to have a tax strategy. And then also you have to have proper asset protection because if you have stuff, guess what? When things get bad, people will try and take that stuff. And it, it's already started to happen. And in the United States, you don't have to do anything wrong to get sued ever. Um, this is like litigation fantasy island. If you're a lawyer, I mean, this is, this is your heaven. Um, and of course, you know, proper estate planning. You want to you want to produce and create as much for the marketplace. You want to position it. You want to grow your wealth, investing in great assets that reduces taxes, appreciate, and produces cash flow. You want to have some areas of growth, have some fun, and but you want to protect all of us. You want to have a wall around your kingdom. So that's what I mean by a framework for wealth creation where. It's not just one thing. You're going to need many tools in that tool belt of yours. And you might have to know a lot of ninja moves, you know, <laughs> as far as tactics to get through in different markets when it goes up, down, or sideways. Yeah, that wow, you touched on a lot of great points. One that's really uh, stood out to me is asset protection. Like you mentioned, we have a very uh, Sue happy uh, society. You know, like you said, you don't really have to do anything wrong to get sued. And, you know, especially in, you know, listen, if you have a, a real estate position, it's typically harder to go after, but it's not impossible. So, you know, kind of talk about some of the strategies behind asset protection and, and setting these up so that if someone came after you, by the time they dug, it looks like you have nothing to your name. Yeah. And a disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. Yes. or a legal yes. professional, and I do not play one on any video platform or any podcast platform. That being said, I can talk to you about the philosophical approach of protecting what you have. Awesome. Now, a lot of folks um, in the past two years have probably heard of the World Economic Forum and all of the stuff that's out there. You know, um, Klaus Schwab that looks like Dr. Evil is in, on many videos talking about uh, you will owe nothing and you will be happy. And my joke at every dinner party or cocktail party conversation is most of the wealthiest people that I know owe nothing, but they control everything and they are happy. <laughs> They're ecstatic. 
<laughs> so um, that's the way to look at this. You know, I'd, I'd launched with a mentor. I mean, we're talking about almost a decade ago. And I remember, great guy. Um, again, didn't have to do anything wrong to get sued. There was some project in it. I mean, him and his partner were getting sued. And um, I was asking him, I said, you know, how's, how's that going? That's kind of got to suck. And he goes, well, I'm not really that worried about that. And I said to him, and I remember I said to him, I said, why are you not that worried about it? And he goes, because I don't own anything. And I'm like, I don't, you're a multi, multi-millionaire. It's like, uh, he doesn't own anything. Everything is, I've, is either in a trust or has asset protection on it. I mean, we went through all the thing. It's funny. We, if he essentially would have taken the stand and they would say, okay, what do you own? Nothing. Well, that can't be. Do you own your house? No, it's owned by a, a trust or an entity. I rent it from that. Okay, so you don't own your house. Uh, do you own your car? No, it's a company vehicle. It's in this owned by this company, and it's a lease, and it's not. It's so it's it's just given to me as part of my basically job uh, uh, compensation package, um, which is the you know he's the one one of the the board members you know started the company as an entrepreneur and so forth. Um, but what else do you have? Checking accounts, all that kind of stuff. No, it's all in trust or it's in a comprehensive trust. Um, all other assets, all other investments, everything is not owned by him. Now, can you control all of that? Of course you can. You can control all of that um, when you have it properly set up, especially comprehensive planning. You could be in a position where you literally don't own a single thing, but you control everything. And it's, you know, you and your spouse, by the way, can control everything. So when you are in a position that something happens or, and again, you don't have to do anything wrong. There are nefarious people every, in every society all over the world. There are people that want the stuff that, that you have. And uh, they usually, where do they look to? Well, they look to business owners and investors to be, you know, their prime targets. So um, if you, from a legal strategy, can position yourself to basically make yourself invisible because you don't own anything, and you don't legally, it's kind of a weird feeling, but you don't, but you still have control over it, you're going to be in a much bigger, uh, a better position to fight off any onslaught that could be coming your way. Um, that would be my take on, on proper legal you know, strategy. And again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal professional, but from a philosophy you know, put yourself and your family in a position that you don't own anything, but you control everything and you're ecstatic and you're, you're happy. <laughs> God, that's so incredible. I mean, being able to set yourself up with that much freedom, right. And I don't, and of course, you know, freedom of time as well as readily available to these people, but just, I just mean freedom in terms of you don't own anything, right? Like, sure, you control it, but you don't actually own anything. And the way that everything flows is all you know obviously controlled and organized but when you look at it from the outside it looks like absolute chaos yeah you and know, it's a holding out. companies and shell companies and all these things and by the time you by the time you actually find the asset it's not even their name attached to it no and it's it's a mentality thing too right it's a mentality thing because most people grow up and i i didn't grow up with money so I grew up middle class too. So it's a mentality thing where you feel like, oh, I own this or this is mine or, you know, we bought that building and that kind of stuff. Um, no, that's not how the, that's not how the 0.01% think, you know, they never think that way. They don't, they don't have that ownership mentality where they have to own everything and everything needs to be in their name. And um, the 0.01% is more, how do I control this? How do I control this? Um, but I am not, I, I don't, I legally don't own anything. There's many ways to do this. And one of the ways that will reason, prime reasons that you want to do this is if there's any, you know, you could almost call it idiotic lawsuit because I've seen stuff, you know, in the past two decades in real estate that most people would fall off their chairs. If you see some of the things that people try to do and come up with, um, those idiotic lawsuits go away when the ambulance chasing lawyer that they that they're going to and me no disrespect to to lawyers everybody's got to earn a living somehow but that goes away when they cannot find anything 
So when you are out there, when you are very searchable and you are on deeds and notes and all this kind of stuff, you know, yeah, now that becomes a, now that becomes an issue. Now you become a target because you are listed as a owner of a specific asset. You know, that's the one thing I love about life insurance too. And people are going to see one of the big trends, huge trends that I've identified and I talk about, and sometimes people laugh at me at first, which they did when I started virtual businesses in 2013 and 2014, when I got into crypto um, around about the same space, when I started my podcast you know, six, seven years ago. Um, but one of the biggest trends is privacy. Privacy. And it's there's going to be a lot of money made by businesses in, in, in privacy. Um, so the life insurance strategy kind of plays into that too, because it's a private contract between you and the life insurance company. When you take those loans against your policy, nobody knows it. It's not on a credit report even. So those are the things that you need to look at too, strategically, you know, what do I have? Why do I have it? And what is it supposed to do for me? You know, in every single part of your wealth strategy. Gosh, that's so incredible. What an incredible system too that that allows that, you know, and and hopefully, you know, people are going to start taking advantage of that. I know I'm certainly going to look into some of these things as well. Um, another one I wanted to touch on real quick too that you could invest in, which is an alternative asset, are the rare earth metals, the things that are powering our cell phones. You know, those aren't going away and that technology is not going anywhere. And there's starting to become more and more opportunity to invest in those as well. So, you know, anytime you know, there's no such thing as, as not being able to find something, you know, to invest in that you don't like, right? Maybe you don't like real estate, fine. You know, there are so many other alternative assets and, and so many other opportunities out there. When billionaires speak, not only listen, but watch what they do. And, and, and what I mean by that is break it down, analyze their thinking. So I'll give you an example. Jim Rogers announced some of his positions. You know, he was interviewed. I've had him on my show a couple of times, but he was just recently interviewed on, a, on another show. Um, and Jim said his three biggest positions is, you know, copper. And then he, he's, also looking, he's also looking at silver and agriculture. He's always been about agriculture, right? He said that farmers would drive Porsches and all that kind of stuff. You know, hot commodities is one of the books that he wrote. So most people would look at that and go, Oh, okay. Well, that's it. Okay. Moving on. No, no, no. How does a billionaire think? So why is he in copper? So then you take a step back and you go, okay, it's a commodity. Commodities are a great play right now, especially in a very inflationary environment, but why? Well, it's one of the biggest ingredients in batteries for electric vehicles. So Jim Rogers isn't running like the Tesla fanboys, nothing wrong with Tesla, um, but the T Tesla fanboys and girls and just buying Tesla stock and trying to pick a winner of all these other electrical vehicles. He's looking at it and going, how do I make money regardless of who wins? Mm -hmm. I don't care if Tesla wins, if Ford wins, or if G General Motors wins. How do I position myself as an investor to make money regardless which way it goes? Well, I get to the source, I get to the copper. And like you mentioned, rare earth metals, which will also be in those batteries and will be in every single device, which we use computers, cell phones, and so forth. So I'm not buying Apple to make sure that they're the leader and staying ahead of computers, smartphones, all that stuff. I buy rare earth metals. Uh, and that doesn't matter who wins, I make money. Um, and it's the same thing you know, um, when he then looks at silver, you know, one of the things that 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 he shared um, is I asked him, you know, because he was he was talking about his investment philosophy and his investment philosophy is, you know, he said, MC, I just sit around and wait. It's very boring and I read a lot. And then I wait until the money is in, just lying on the floor in the corner of the room. And then I walk over it and then I just pick it up and then I sit down again and I read. And that's a silver play. Silver, one of the most undervalued assets now on the planet, has the most patents, by the way, out on it than any other uh, commodity right now and products too. It's in most of our other stuff that we take for granted and use too. Um, also in medicine. Um, but he looks at that. 
um, very undervalued. So, you know, one of the plays is silver, the money is just sitting there in the corner. I'm just going to walk over and then pick it up. And then obviously, you know, these other plays, agriculture, which leads into food, you know, and then there's many ways to play it. Do you buy a farm? Yes, you could buy a farm. But what would every single farm on the planet need? Probably fertilizer. Yep. So you can, there's a play that you can play into fertilizer. That gets you again where the copper is in the EV market. The fertilizer gets you on with farming. So um, there, you know, there's a lot of different ways of how to invest. But what I will tell to your, to your listeners too is don't just listen to what they say. Watch what they do and break down what they're saying. Like, why is he doing this? Like trying to figure it out. Like, how do I get inside this mind? Mm-hmm. Um, and you, I mean, it's a great learning experience to do debrief too. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're basically just reverse engineering their logic and, and determining why it's happening. And then you can follow suit, right? I know Robert Kiyosaki, Kiyosaki is also a big proponent of uh, silver as well. So, yep. you know, you have literally the guy who wrote the, the Bible for, you know, creating passive income and, you know, he's investing a certain way and instead of being like oh that doesn't make any sense go figure out why they're doing that because listen they're doing it for a reason they're not just throwing money around you know they're billionaires for a reason you know or sent to millionaires for a reason so it's important to understand why they're doing something and you know not everyone of course has that kind of money but you can take on little positions small positions are better than no position at all so that's an important uh, important thing as well. Yeah. And, and back to the framework, right? If you have everything set up properly, you're making money, you're positioning it, your capital, you have some cash flow investments and diversified cash flow streams. Um, then you've got a, a vehicle, you know, a bucket, which is your growth bucket. So there's there, that's a bucket that you keep for shots, you know, for bottlenecks that you see for certain plays that'll give you enormous growth. Uh, and then, of course, the other pillar would be protection, you know, your tax strategy, estate planning, and your asset protection. But you ha- need all those things. If you only have the growth bucket and take shots all the time, it's going to get ugly. And, and it, <laughs> you're, I don't think you're, you're going to get ahead of the game, but you have all the other things in place that allows you to take those shots. And that allows you from time to time to figure out what the bottlenecks are, to figure out certain plays, certain things that people are not seeing. So um, anyway, so that, that's, you know, that's the way to look at it. Have, have a strategy. Don't have just one thing. Right now in a world with so much uncertainty, oh my gosh, if you only have one thing right now, um, Tough. you know, yeah, I mean, there's if look, even if you just take a quadrant and you put in cash, metals, you put your cash flow portfolio and like grow stuff like crypto and you put put it in that, that quadrant. If you have those four things, you're going to be better positioned than most people out there because that one knock in one certain direction is going to offset, you know, one part is going to offset another one. So what do I mean by that? What if there's massive inflation? Mm-hmm. Well, your cash flow portfolio is going to sky up. You're going to have great cash flow, great appreciation, and your growth bucket's going to explode. Metals is just going to linger. Kind of your cash is just going to basically sit there, but you need cash. What if there's a deflationary event? A bond, the bond market could pop, the biggest market on the planet. People don't understand how big the debt market is. Right. It is a behemoth. It is the biggest market on the planet. Every other market is like, a, a small friction of the debt market. So what happens at the debt market pop? Every single uh, market will be impacted by that and it will be deflationary. So using that example, your cash flow portfolio might, might take a little bit of a hit um, or it might be slower. That's why you have to have great operators. So you could probably chug along. Your growth bucket will be hit because people, especially crypto, very liquid, sell it off to cover margin calls and um, rebounds other positions, but then your metals will help you and you've got cash then to swoop up and scoop up assets at a discount. Yeah. So be balanced, have a framework, have a diversified portfolio and allocations. You know, um, there isn't one tool that's going to, that's going to be the magic tool and cure all problems and, you know, cure all ills in, in uh, the world that we live in today. Absolutely. At a basic level, you're just hedging, right? 
you, you know that when certain things move in certain direction and listen, if you want to take on a bigger chunk in one, you know, if you're bullish on one more than the other, that's fine. But having those in place, even down to the basic level of a stock portfolio, right? Yep. Don't just go all in tech and, you know, tech energy, right? I even have some like utility stock, right? Just in case, you know, yep. like these things that, you know, ebb and flow as the market ebb and flows that way, there's always, a little hedge in case, you know, something does take a huge dip. You always have something that's moving, you know, in the right direction. So, so, so important. Obviously we could talk for hours and hours about this. This is like my favorite thing. So um, we are nearing the end here. So I do have five questions that I ask all of my um, guests. It's the final five questions. The first sure. one is the best advice you've gotten from a mentor. You know, best advice. Well, I've gotten some incredible advice lately, but one, two things that will always be valuable, regardless of what the world looks like. And they've been valuable since the beginning of time, intellectual shortcuts and network shortcuts. So there's an overflow of information right now. If you can condense it and provide someone an intellectual shortcut to help them figure out something or solve a problem for them, that's valuable. If you can a plug someone into a powerful network, a network that could take them, I don't know, five, 10, 20 years to, to build themselves. That's valuable. Love that. That's so awesome. What is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? I get to do, I get up every day and I get to do what, whatever I want, which is kind of nice. Um, so that allows me to, to be uh, working in purpose uh, and within my purpose every single day. Um, and that gets me to um, operate at uh, and serve at a higher level, um, operate at a very uh, fulfilled, a very passionate and a very, um, you know, in a, in a very spiritual way. So that's the nice thing. I love that. And guys, just as a note, this is achievable for anyone, right? This isn't special to MC or to the 0.01%. Right. Yep. This, this type of freedom is achievable. So um, awesome. What's your, so you're a big reader is what I kind of took when you were talking earlier. So what's your favorite non real estate or investment related book? Here's a book that everybody should be reading right now. Cause this is happening in the world right now. The creature from Jekyll Island by Mr. G Edward Griffin. Um, it explains to you what money is, how money works, how the entire global monetary system works, how the global financial system works and then also how the banking system works. Um, it was an incredible book that I read. I mean, this he wrote this in the 90s. And it's every single crisis since then. If you read the book, you knew exactly what was happening. That's uh, spoiler alert, the newspapers are not telling you what's really going on. So what? you'll be able to figure it out for yourself <laughs> by reading that book. <laughs> You're kidding me. You mean mainstream media isn't telling us the truth? I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> who do all right yeah. if you could have any superpower what would it be wow that's a good question um the crystal to 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 be in the crystal ball business to to <laughs> see the future in a crystal ball that would be <laughs> that's God, the best answer you, i could come up with on that one i love that all right and last one what's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more CashflowNinja.com. CashflowNinja.com uh, is all of our podcasts, tools, resources, programs. And for your listeners, uh, we have, I've got a new book out, The 21 Based Cashflow Niches. If, and this is just giving you different ideas of uh, investment opportunities. I've interviewed the best minds in business and investing for the past six years. Pick the best niches. It's in the book. And when your listeners purchase a copy on the book, the 21 Based Cashflow Niches, which is available on Amazon or at cashflowninja.com, just screenshot a proof of your purchase, send it to my team at info at cashflowninja.com, and we'll give you access to a digital version if you want to read it on Kindle, an audio version if you just want to listen to it, a curated library of people talking about the niches so you don't have to listen to 850 episodes, and then also more bonus uh, goodies, but that's the 21 Based Cashflow Niches. I love it. Awesome. We will link that in the show notes. MC, this has been incredible. Seriously, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, we'll definitely have another episode because we've got so much more to talk about, I, I'm sure. So thank you again very much. Awesome. Thank you. 
Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Um, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe, it helps a ton. Leave comments, we'd love to know what you guys think and uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.